recently by a group of people I want to talk to you about who do end up ruling Iran for a few centuries. These are the Parthians who are going to basically take over Iran from the Seleucids around 248 BC, and they will rule till they basically get displaced in 224 AD. Now, I want to say a few things about the Parthians. They're an interesting dynasty. First of all, the Parthians are a nomadic Iranian tribe, and they occupy the greater part of the Eurasian steppe zone. They are a nomadic, a nomadic Iranian tribe occupying the greater part of the Eurasian steppe zone. Before the conquest of the Seleucids, before the conquest of the Seleucids, the most recent Parthian homeland, before the conquest of the Seleucids, the most recent Parthian homeland appears to have been south of the Aral Sea, look at the board, and along the Oxus River, right over here. Okay. That's the Aral Sea, A-R-A-L. And is this the area of the Parthians? That's the area that they rule before they displace the Seleucids. Okay, now, they were mostly breeders of cattle and horses. That's what the Parthians mostly were, and you'd expect, expect that for them being steppe nomads. They'd have to have some type of equestrian prowess. They're always in movement. Now, during the 3rd century BC, during the 3rd century BC's middle decades, during the 3rd century BC's middle decades, the Parthians will advance, will advance into Seleucid territory. The area that I'm talking about, the area that I'm talking about will be modern day, will be modern day southern Turkmenistan. It will be modern day southern Turkmenistan. And I'll go to the board, so uh, I'll go to the map, so bear with me and the Iranian province of Gurgaon. And that is located just east of the Caspian Sea in this area. So they're radiating out from here, okay? It's a southward push, okay? Ken? Did Alexander win that before he died? Alexander made inroads into Afghanistan. That's correct. To this day, in Afghanistan, you have the Greek city of Iconum, which is the World Heritage Site. And if you take your trip, I'll be with you in a second, if you take your trip to Afghanistan, which I hope you do, okay, in the foothills of the Hindu Kush, where you wouldn't expect to see anything resembling the Mediterranean, is a city with bionic columns, Greek amphitheaters, and gymnasia. And it's the city of Iconu. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you a little story. You don't have to take this down. It's basically in Greek-controlled Bactri or Afghanistan that you get the first physical representations of the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. Why? Because the Buddhists would actually preach their ideas to the Greeks there. And then the Greeks would say to them, you see that? Statue of Zeus. You see that? That's Poseidon. That's Athena. That's Ares, that's Hades. What does your god, the Buddha, look like? And because of the fact that the Buddhists figure the more like the Greeks the Buddha looks like, the more they'll be likely to accept them, the earliest depictions of the Buddha are in a Greek robe with a mustache and Europeanized features. And if you want to see that, Go to the second floor, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the South Asian wing, and the first representations of the Buddha you see make them look like a Greek gentleman. Okay? This is not the very jolly, corpulent Chinese Buddha who looks like a lot more fun to hang out with. Okay? <laughs> this is, in effect, going to be someone who looks almost like a Greek philosopher. Okay? Now, 
Uh, basically, uh, Josh, you had a question or yeah. comment. I'm sorry. So during the, the, some, I the of the end, uh, this is the middle of the third century BC. Okay, that's when the Parthians are in motion. Now, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. They would technically be very closely related. They're going to be very closely related to the Iranians and Medes and ethnicity. However, there's going to be a glitch, and I think you'll find this interesting. Alexander Seleucus had controlled Iran, and yet they didn't leave a Greek imprint on the population. Yet, in the far outposts of Alexander's kingdom, for some reason or other, the Parthians will take in Hellenic culture. And I'm going to tell you that, the, that actually when the Parthians make their own coinage, they do it with Greek letters, Greek inscriptions. They perform Greek plays. As a matter of fact, if you're familiar with the conflict between the Romans and the Parthians, you know that the Parthians killed Marcus Crassus, who was one of the um, uh, members of the First Triumvirate at the Battle of Carhae in 53 BC, and they actually took his severed head and they used it as a prop in Euripides' Bacchae. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to elaborate on this. Um, now, first of all, the Parthians are going to be led into the Seleucid area by two brothers. One of the brothers will give his name to the dynasty of the Parthians. His name is Arsaces. Henceforth, the Parthians will be known as Arsaces. Arsaces, he's, um, one of the warriors of the Parthians who is going to lead armies against the Seleucids. And he's going to do it with his brother, Tiridates. If these names seem almost Greek, there's a reason for that. And this is not <laughs> due to Herodotus, who will have been dead before the Parthian Empire was formed. This is due to the fact that the Parthians will have a proclivity toward Greek culture. Okay? They'll have a proclivity, a pension, an inclination toward Greek culture. Okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just because... Oh, yeah. 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 This is a power play. This is not going to be a basic discussion on uh, how you interpret Plato. Good question. They did it for the most part because they identified in many ways with Greek culture. They were beguiled by it. They found it fascinating. They find this to be a higher form of culture. So while there were many nomads that are sedentary, are usually seen as being backwards. The Parthians have the distinction of being step nomads that have a certain amount of high culture, which is kind of unusual. It's very odd. And uh, basically what's going to happen around 248 or so is Arsaces and his brother Tiridates uh, basically fight a battle in 248 against the Seleucids. Arsaces is killed. Arsaces is killed but his brother Tiridates will continue his advance and he's going to basically take over the area flanking the Elburz Mountains. So he's going to take over the area flanking the Elburz Mountains and this is Tiridates because his brother is killed. So our sassy is out of the picture now. Okay. This is going to be flanking the Elbert Mountains. So we remember the Elbert Mountains. This is north and of Iran, north uh, west Iran, south of the Caspian Sea. We remember that from our first lecture. Think of it as the Caspian Sea literal, okay, if that helps you out. And he's going to begin his systematic conquest of the interior of the Iranian plateau. So Tiridates will basically take over the Iranian plateau, and this is going to be crea uh, basically completed. This is going to be completed over time by the ruler Mithridates I. And I'm going to put up his reign 
year. I'm sorry? Is this the same as the readings with the Roman Sanders? Uh, that will be later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that will be a little bit later. It's going, he is going to have conflict with it's that. Yes, he is going to have conflict with that. I'm sorry? Mr. Davies is the Arsacid Shah who is going to complete the conquest of Iran by the Parthians, by the Arsacids. Okay, now what Mr. Davies' uh, kingdom will look like. Okay, he's going to rule from the Euphrates in the west to Herat in the east. Look at the map. Okay, the Euphrates is in Herat. Okay, Herat is in what would be Afghanistan. So this is the east-west borders of Mithridates' rule. Ken? I'm sorry? Well, what ended up happening was the Seleucids were encountering resistance at already in 250. It's in 248 that the Seleucids are really thrown totally out of Iran or killed. Okay? Technically, their rule, meaning their government, ends in 250. No one listens to them after 250. They no longer have a uh, rule. Okay? But the Parthians are going to fill what will be a power vacuum by 248. You could see it that way, yes. Okay? It's going to be a period of, of power vacuum. Okay? For about two years. Now, Mr. Dates the first it's going to recognize the strategic and commercial importance of Mesopotamia. So he wants to establish a capital for the Parthians in Mesopotamia. And he wants it to be, of course, on a river, and he's going to choose the Tigris River, and the city that he creates, the capital he creates, will be the capital of Ctesiphon. What city is it today? Excellent. Very good, Stephen. Baghdad. Okay. Now, Ctesiphon is near commercially active areas. The summer capital for the per old Achaemenid Persian Empire of Ecbatana will be retained. So Ecbatana will be used as a summer capital being that Ctesiphon is sweltering. After 138 BC, after 138 BC, the Parthian Empire will oscillate. After 138 BC, the Parthian Empire will oscillate between periods of vigorous expansion followed by periods of foreign invasion so the, after 138 BC, the Parthian Empire will oscillate between periods of vigorous expansion, followed by periods of foreign invasion, ruthless court, factional discord, meaning ruthless court intrigue. There's going to be fighting among nobles, okay, and prolonged civil wars. So this is not going to be a very stable empire, okay? It's going to be very fluid. Yeah, because here's the deal. It's one thing, Pamela, to take over an area. It's another thing to pass it on. And there, it's hard to be everywhere at once. And we'll talk about the way the party has structured their military. Their military was very decentralized. And that usually invites resistance. And I'll explain to you about that later. Okay? Now, with regard to the high point of Parthian consolidation and expansion. One of the high points of it, I should say, is going to be under Mithridates II. And he basically ruled for about 123 what is this, like something like 82, uh, 87, excuse me. 
Mr. Davies' section, by the way, don't take this down, but notice that this sounds very Greek, but also notice something else. My turn, the Persian sun god. So there's going to be an amalgam, an amalgam between Persian and Greek sounding names. And this is a composite. Now, uh, Mithridates II is going to defeat Saka invaders that threaten his northeastern border. He's going to be noted for defeating the Saka invaders threatening the northeastern border of the empire. Now, I just want to say a few things more about the Parthians and then compare and contrast them with the Sassanids. Now, during the first 200 years of Parthian rule, during the first 200 years of Parthian rule, there was a powerful fascination with Hellenic culture. During the first 200 years of Parthian rule, there's a powerful fascination with Hellenic culture. Greek was spoken widely by the Parthian ruling class. Greek was spoken widely by the Parthian ruling class it was used for administration and was inscribed on the coinage. However, however, this fascination with Hellenism, this fascination with Greek culture will falter, this fascination with Hellenism will falter as a conflict with Rome drags out. So the fascination with Hellenism will falter as the Parthians begin to have conflict with Rome, because basically the Parthians are going to realize with the Romans that the Romans were very close to Greek culture and very alien to them. So they're going, this will cause a return, this will cause a return to Iranian heritage. This will cause a return to Iranian heritage under Vologeses I. And Vologeses I is going to basically rule from 51 to 80, and he's the one that's more conscious of, of, kind of uh, keeping the Parthians close to Iranian roots. So he's going to create a deliberate policy of Iranicization. He's going to create a deliberate policy of Iranicization. Now, prior to Vologeses I, the Parthians were very, very tolerant. And the Parthians would accept Buddhism, Christianity, and the mystery cult that were very popular in Rome, the cult of Isis, cult of Kibbele, the Great Mother, Alma Mater, um, and they're going to be very tolerant. And that comes with the fact that uh, basically if you're going to accept Greek culture, why not accept other ideas as well? That being said, Vologeses' policy must have been undertaken half-heartedly, or it was initiated way too late. And I'll tell you why. The reason why is because the Parthians will eventually be overthrown by a rebellion. Now, this is going to take a while. It will be in 224. They'll be eventually overthrown by a rebellion which stresses the indigenous origin of its leader and the alien nature of Parthian rule. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make it real easy for you. Basically, there were some Parthians who wanted to stay loyal to Greek culture. 
But there are other Iranians, listen carefully, other Iranians who saw the Parthians as not being real Iranians because of their affinity for Greek culture. They didn't see them as full-blooded Iranians. We don't care that you come from the steppes. You're speaking Greek. You put Greek on your coinage. We can't read it. We don't understand it. And now you want Iranicization? Guess what? We were Iranicized before you were. We still see you as a foreign or kind of like half Iranian ruling class. Basically, what's going to happen with the Parthians is they're going to seem alien no matter what they do at this point. Okay? Now, 